So this is lecture 11. Let us now quickly look at some of the circuit connections that you can make with a CMOS inverter. Let's say I take a CMOS inverter and connect its input to the output. What comment can you make about the output? It will oscillate. Will it oscillate? It will be fixed at midpoint voltage. This is basically V0 equal to VI, right? So this will go to the midpoint voltage or the switching threshold of the inverter. So this is not particularly useful for digital designers because you are at the intermediate voltage, right? Now, let's say I take two inverters and then I put that in a connection like this. What comment can you make about the output? It will be fixed at one of the logic levels, right? For example, let's assume that, so all of these nodes will have parasitic capacitance as you have just calculated right now, right? So if this node has a capacitance, which was initially discharged, let's say, then this node will be at VDD. This node is going to be at zero. So the zero is again driving this node. So the states are not going to change, right? Basically this circuit has now, has memory now. Unless you drive something else from outside, it will be able to hold this value as long as supply voltages are there. Right? So this is basically a latch. Okay, so now we'll put three inverters in a feedback. Now what do you think will happen? PM? This will oscillate, right? So for example, let's start with zero volt here. You will have VDD, so logic one. This will be logic zero. This is logic one, which means now the zero is going to get overwritten by logic one. Now, if you keep going like this, you will see that every node is going to switch between zero and one. So if I were to plot the output at this node, this will oscillate. So if you have only three stages, by the time this reaches one, it will be forced to go to zero because the uh, incoming feedback will come in very fast. But if you had, let's say nine stages, then you are more likely to get a square wave ish wave. With of course, uh, this period is going to be much larger than the period here. So what comment can you make about the period of oscillation? This will be equal to sum of sum of all delays. So let me say that the delay of one inverter is TP. So is this three TP? Let us look at, so I will assume that the uh, square wave is very periodic, right? So if I had, let's say I had a rising edge at this node. In one, this is in two, and in three, this is again in one. So a rising edge here is going to result in a falling edge here. This falling edge will result in a rising edge at N3. This rising edge will now result in a falling edge. So we have gone through three TPs now. This is the first TP, second TP, and the third TP is between this edge and this edge. So, so much is three TP. Is this okay? Now you need to go through three more TPs, three more inverter stages to get the next rising edge. Okay, therefore the total time period is now going to be 60. Sorry. Why won't the voltage be fixed at VM? Um, okay, so, a quick answer is that here for every inverter, V0 is not equal to VM, okay? So now, uh, why don't you think about this and come with a reason why it should be fixed to VM? Right. It will satisfy the condition, but as long as the circuit has noise, this will resolve to one or the other term. Right? If circuit did not, so VM is like a metastable condition. Even if you somehow force it to VM, 
the moment you take away that forcing factor, it, within some time, it will resolve to zero VDD effect. Okay, so now here is a quick question for you. You can think about this and find the answer. Let's say instead of TP, I'm telling you the values of TPHL and TPLH. So derive the expression for frequency in terms of TPLH and TPH. You can think about this problem. But of course, once I have the time period, I can calculate the frequency as F is equal to 1 by 6 TP. So if I had n stages, instead of three stages, this would simply become twice n TP. Okay. So one of the places where the ring oscillator is used is to monitor the process variation in a chip. Okay. So have you heard of process variation? How many of you have heard? Ah, okay, good. It's a good question. So I'm going to talk about PVT variation, where the process P stands for process, V stands for voltage and T stands for temperature. So I'll cover the process variation in a little bit more detail. So you know that all your dyes are manufactured or fabricated on a wafer. So the wafer will look something like this. I have taken this image from the TSMC website. So this is basically a circular wafer whose diameter is roughly 300 millimeters. And this wafer is then divided into multiple dyes like this. Okay, so you can clearly see different dyes in this figure, right? For example, this is one dye, here you have another dye, etc. And then once the whole thing is fabricated on the wafer, this is cut into smaller dyes, it is diced into smaller dye. And in the very first class, when you held a chip, this very small silicon dye inside it was initially part of a wafer like this. It was part of a wafer, then it was diced and given to us. Right. So now if I were to take, let's say, chip number 20 and say a chip here, uh, die number 400, they will have certain variation in the transistor properties. For example, let's say I take die number 20. I look at all the NMOS transistors on that die, and then I plot their threshold voltages. And you can plot a histogram based on this. This will have a Gaussian distribution with some mean. Let me call this as VTH20 because it is die 20, right? Similarly, I can take my 400th die and look at all the threshold voltages of the NMOS transistors and get another Gaussian distribution. What comment can you make about the second Gaussian distribution with respect to the first? Yeah. Will it have the same mean? Ideally, it should be safe, but we don't live in an ideal world. It turns out the mean is now going to be different. So this is VTH 400, right? So you see that there is a drift in the threshold voltages as you go from one die to another. So now if you had 100 chips from one wafer, you can possibly be, you will possibly be looking at 100 different VTH mean values. And these differences are happening due to certain variations in the fabrication process. For example, the iron implantation would be much stronger at the center of the wafer than at the periphery. Similarly, you could have errors in lithography, which results in small variation in the length of the transistors, width of the transistors, et cetera. So all of this is going to result in variations in transistor properties from one die to another. And this is called as inter die variation. It is also called as die to die variation. This should be two. And this is approximated as D2D. So designers know this variation as process variation. 
And this is not just the threshold voltage, the mobility, COX, all of these properties can have a shift as you go from one die to the other. Now, similarly, within the same die, you see that the VTH values are not constant. It is varying. So if I look at all the transistors within one die, right, they all need not have the same threshold voltage. Again, this is happening uh, partly if the die is very huge, right? Then all the reasons I mentioned for wafer is true from one end of the die to the other end of the die. There are also what is uh, called as a random dopant fluctuations, which is minor variations in the number of dopant atoms available in the source and the diffusion regions. So all of this is going to result in the transistor properties to vary within a die. So this is called as intra-die variation. also called as within die variation. Or WID. Do you know what we call this as commonly during designs? We simply say that there are mismatches between the transistors. This is okay. So now the variations in threshold, mobility, COX, velocity, saturation, variations in all of these parameters are going to affect our transistor's behavior in a circuit. And we generally lump all these effects in terms of the speed at which the transistor is operating, the speed at which it is going to switch. So we can say that a transistor could be either fast, it could have a typical behavior, or it can have a slow behavior. Now, it's not necessary that both NMOS and PMOS will lie within the same corner. So you can potentially have NMOS being very fast and PMOS being slow. So there is a very nice qualitative diagram that is used to represent this. So let's say you have your NMOS here and PMOS on y-axis. Fast, slow, fast and slow. Right. So now if both NMOS and PMOS come in the typical corner, we say that this is a TT corner, typical, typical. If NMOS and PMOS are fast, then this is FF corner. If both of them are slow, this is an SS corner. Now, if the NMOS is fast and PMOS is slow, we say this is an SF corner. Similarly, you will have an FS corner. Now, I kept using the term corner continuously throughout this explanation. The reason why it is called as the corner is because they form the corners of this box within which the foundry tries to make sure that the transistor properties will lie within these corners, within, within this qualitative box. Okay. So now the foundry is going to make sure that very loosely speaking, the transistor is going to be within this boundary and then it will provide its designers with model files corresponding to all of these corners. So we'll have model files for typical TT, SS, F, FF, FS, and SF. Now, there are slightly different terminologies also available. For example, sometimes instead of calling it as slow PMOS and slow NMOS, it might say slow one or a slow zero. Right? Because if the PMOS is slow, the time taken for charging will be slow. So one is slow. Right? Or it might simply call as the best case. So best case generally refers to both the devices being at the fast corner. Similarly, they call it as typical case and worst case. Worst case is when both of them fall within the slow corner. So when you're designing, you now have to make sure that your design works across all these corners. It is not enough to verify that you're... So especially in academic projects, right? When you do, you have a model file, you verify it for one corner and it is done. When you did projects in 610, or now that you're going to do projects in 610, very less likely that you will have access to all these corner files. You'll be verifying that the circuit is working at particular corner. But in practice, you have to run your simulation across all of these corners and make sure that you're designed with specification across all of them. For example, it is possible that you are designing at FF corner just to meet the specification at SS corner. So over designing is usually uh, will usually happen at some corner so that you can meet your spec at the other corners. 
Okay. So now, as a designer, when you do your design, you would you do the design, you get the chip fabricated. When you're testing, you would like to know in which corner the chip has come in, right? So one quick way to do that is to put ring oscillators in your chip. So let's say this is your die. You can put a small ring oscillator in a corner, right? And then the transistor properties will affect the delay of the inverter which in turn will affect the frequency of the oscillation. So you can hook up a ring oscillator like this, take the signal out and observe F0. So if you have two dice and you have a typical performance that you expect from simulations, you can look at what is the frequency you are getting from these dice and determine whether they are a typical corner or fast or slow corner. Right? Now, if your die is very large, as I mentioned earlier, you can have different transistor properties across the die. So then, if required, you can put another ring oscillator in the other part. So now, due to these reasons, these ring oscillators are called as global process monitor. Because they are helping you monitor the process variation. Okay. So now here is a quick question. Let's say I use a three-stage ring oscillator and my TP is equal to 20 picosecond. N is equal to 3. Can you tell me what is the frequency of operation? How much are you getting? 8.3 unit gigahertz. What do you think of this frequency? Is it high, low? This is on the higher side. And it's very difficult to take uh, this range of frequency outside the chip for measurements. To do this, you will have to use differential signaling and probably low voltage signaling. Have very good drivers. Make sure all the parasitics are lower. Everything is matched. If you do, don't do all of this, the signal is going to get attenuated. You will not be able to measure it. So a common approach is simply to increase this N. You make it very large so that the frequency is smaller. And then if required, at the output, so you will have a ring oscillator like this with large number of stages. And then at the output, you can have divide by two or divide by four circuits, frequency dividers, to divide the frequency even further. So this way you will get your frequency in the range of couple of hundreds of megahertz, which is very easy to measure. Okay. So now this is from the point of view of the designer, right? From the foundry's point of view, they also need to make sure that their process is very tightly controlled. If their values are drifting, then they need to either tweak their fabrication process or inform the designers about the drift in the value, in the model files, right? So they also need to measure it. The problem is the area on the die is very expensive, right? So they cannot simply say that, for example, I will use a particular die area here for putting my ring oscillator, right? Because if they want to do it, they will have to do it across the wafer because the properties are going to change across the wafer. So that is one part. The second part is they are going to lose out on money, right? It's like I said, the real estate on silicon wafer is very, very expensive. So what they do is this. You see this area between two dies, this area, right? Now that area is there because when you dice or cut the wafer, you don't damage the adjacent dice, okay? And this area is called as curve. Now they can put their test circuits in this region, in the curve, because it is anyways not useful. They are not able to earn an income from this. So they'll put any feature that they want to test, such as their transistors, the contact, certain metal lines, etc., along with ring oscillators in this region. And once they do all the measurements, when you cut the die, when you dice it, it is lost, but you got the measurement that you want. Okay? So this is how the foundry also uh, keeps track of how their process is varying over time. Now let me show you. So this image.
So this image, uh, as you can see, I've taken this from uh, Veste and Harris textbook. So the references are given here, but this is basically showing you how the ring oscillator frequency is varying across the vapor. For example, at the center here, you have ring oscillator frequency around hundreds of megahertz. And as you move towards the periphery, it is going below 80 megahertz. All right. So now, even after all of this, when you fabricate your chip, for example, uh, let's say we are fabricating the Intel i9 processor, right? So you have the same design, it is fabricated across the vapor, and then you'll find that some of your chips have come in the fast corner. Certain others have come in the slow corner, which means the frequency of operation, the power consumption, all of this are going to be very different. Now, there is no reason to sell both of them at the same rate, right? So they do a process called as chip binning. So the process is called as binning where they put all the chips that have come in the fast corner. They say that it can operate at a higher frequency and sell it for higher rate. Whereas the chips at the slow corner, they will sell it for lower rate with a slightly different specification. Now, let's say you are doing a processor with 10 cores. Now, it's possible that at the end of all this fabrication process, maybe two cores are damaged due to various reasons. Now, you have two cores damaged, but eight perfectly functioning cores. Now, it is a waste to throw out this dye because like I said, dye area is very expensive. So they again sell it, saying that it is an eight core processor to the customers at a lower rate. So I can show you an example. So all of these processors have come from the same I9 vapor. So you can see that the base clock, base clock is the, uh, the maximum clock rate at which the whole system is guaranteed to function at all times. Turbo clock is when you uh, run it for a short period at very high frequency, right? So you can see that they have different base clocks, different cores, et cetera. But all of them have basically come from the same uh, single ion and wave. So the, they book the wafer for fabricating a particular ion and processor, and then based on the results, based on the dye, they have binned it into different lips. So something at the top of the list, you will pay more money uh, to buy because the performance is also going to be there. So basically this chip binning, it is uh, because of the process variation and some of them are defects also. Like the during this process, like when you are fabricating it, the circuit that is sent to the foundry is the same. Right? But some portions of the circuit could have been damaged during the fabrication process. So instead of throwing it out, for example, they sell it with less number of cores. So they'll disable certain portions of the circuit and then sell it. So this allows the uh, manufacturer, the company, etc., to increase the yield. So if they, if they are fabricating, for example, 100 ICs, uh, 100 dies, it's not necessary that all 100 dies will be functional. Some of them will have defects and they'll have to throw out. But this sort of winning will allow them to salvage as many dice as possible. So any questions on this? If not, now we can move on to combinational circuits. So we have learned about inverters very thoroughly. So let me help you look at this inverter in a slightly different perspective. So all the circuit consists of is that it has a pull up network, PUN. And then it has a pull down network or PDN. 
both pull up network and pull down network has has been connected to the input and this node is your output okay so now i'm going to draw the pull up network and pull down network separately and we'll do the truth table for it so the pull up network for the inverter let me draw it along with the vdd simply consists of a pmos why pmos Why not NMOS? Correct. Because PMOS is better at passing a one than, uh, yeah, PMOS is better at passing a one than an NMOS, right? So input can take two values, zero and one. What is the state of the output? When input is zero, what is output? When input is one, what is the output? It is floating, floating, right? So basically, again, let me consider the parasitic capacitance at this node. If this capacitor had some value, either logic zero or logic one, once the input is one, it is going to retain that value, right? So the net is floating. So we say that this net is now high impedance. And we denote it using Z, okay? Similarly, quickly tell me the truth table for the NMOS or the pull down network. You have in, this is your out. In can take two values, zero and one. When input is zero, what is the output? It is floating, it is high impedance. And when input is one, the output is zero, okay? So now there are two scenarios, right? The pull-up network can either have a definite output or it could be, uh, the output could be high impedance, right? That is the pull-up network could be on or off. Similarly, the pull-down network can also be on or off. So let's put all four cases together. So you have pull-up network can be off or the pull-up network can be on. Similarly, the pull-down network can also be off or it can be on. Now let us look at the output under all four cases. When both are off, what is the output? Pull-up network is off, pull-down network is off. What can you say about the output? High impedance. Right, it is floating. When pull up network is on and pull down is off, it is one. Pull down is on and pull up is off, it is zero. And when both of them are on, it will be, huh, it will be an indeterminate value, right? We shouldn't say don't care because uh, don't care conditions depend on uh, the circuit topology itself. So this is an indeterminate value. Right, and it could even be a value between uh, VIH and VIF, right? So you can't clearly say whether it is logic zero or logic one. So under this condition, your pull up network and your pull down network are on, which means you have a constant current flowing from VDD to ground. And this node voltage will now depend on the relative strength of pull-up network and pull-down network, okay? So what comment can you make about the static power consumption in all four cases? Uh, you can ignore leakage currents. If you ignore leakage currents, under which of these cases do you have static power consumption? Last one, right? So now in complementary static CMOS logic, which is what we are going to learn now, you will generally, you will be within these two regimes. You will have either pull up or pull down network on and the other as off, okay? Now in other styles of logic, such as ratioed logic, dynamic logic, et cetera, you can come to either of these regions as well. But right now we are only interested in these two regions. Okay, so now we said that for an inverter, 
your circuit is like this. You had a full up network, which was connected to one input, pull down network connected to same invert, same input, and your output is a function of this particular input. Now our aim is to make our output a function of multiple inputs. So to do this, we will have to connect all these inputs to both the pull-up network. So this goes from in one to, let's say, some in n, as well as the pull-down network. OK? So to do this, we will first start by looking at commonly used pull-up and pull-down networks. So let's start with the pull-down network. So we are going to look at the network as well as its truth table. So there are, of course, two very quick possibilities that you can think of, right? You can have A and B. Let's say two transistors with input A and B connected in series. This is your output. So you can write the truth table for this. The other possibility is when both of them are connected in parallel. You have A, B, and then an output 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. What is the truth table? Both of them are 0. What is the output? High impedance. Right? So, second case. This is also high impedance and finally zero. So this now corresponds to, you need to have A and B as one. So this now corresponds to A dot B, but the output is zero. So basically A dot B part, right? Now I can't write an equation here because all of these are high impedance values. Now, what about the truth table for this? So Z, 0, 0, 0. So what does this correspond to? This is A plus B, the whole part. Okay. So let's repeat the same thing for pull-up networks. What does this correspond to? So this, you're saying it is A plus B complement. Is that what you're saying? But then it would mean that A has to be one and B has to be one for the output to be zero. That's not what you're getting, right? A has to be zero, B has to be zero for the output to be one. So it should be A bar, so it's dot B bar. Okay. Similarly for this. What does this correspond to? So either A has to be zero or B has to be zero and the output is one. Okay. So now based on all of this information, let us try and implement a very simple logic gate. We are going to implement y is equal to a dot b bar. 
Which one? This one, yeah, I can write it as a dot b the whole part. Uh, you can use De Morgan's law and uh, replace it, but this is the direct expression, right? A is zero, B is zero, and if both of them are zero, your output is zero. So I'll come to that. But for now, is this expression clear? And uh, for PMOS especially, you want the input to be zero, right? So if you write it, if the expression is in form of A bar and B bar, you know that you can connect A and B directly. So that way it makes it a little easier. Okay, so now we are going to implement y is equal to a dot b bar, uh, a dot b the whole bar. So based on the common PDNs and common PUNs that we have derived so far, you will be able to implement it directly, I'm sure, right? You just have to make sure that both the networks are not on at the same time. When one network is driving the output, the other has to be at high impedance state, right? So let me show you an easier way to do this. So let us start with the PDN. So let's write the truth table. Truth table is fine. So we know that the ones have to come from the pull up network. The zero has to come from the pull down network. Let's start with the pull down network. So I'm going to write an expression for y bar. This will be equal to a dot b. So all that this means is when a is one and b is one, the output is zero, okay? Right? So that you can quickly implement like this. You know that the dot function comes, the and function comes when things are in series, right? So this is a, this is b and my output is now driven when A and B are equal to one. Now to implement the pull-up network, so I will look at A dot B the whole bar. So I want to get the output. I want to get the states when A is equal to, when the output is equal to one, but in <coughs> terms of zeros for A and B. That means I should have A bar and B bar in the expression. Right? So I can easily use De Morgan's law and write this as A bar plus B bar. So if you have the OR condition, by now we know that they have to be in parallel. So you have A and B in parallel like this. Is this okay? Should I write A or A bar here? It has to be A, right? Because when A is zero is when you get this. So this is a very easy NAND circuit. Now a quick way to do the pull up network is you do the pull down network as usual and then you take the dual of it. So if you have something in series in the pull down network, it becomes parallel in the pull up net. So series in PDN becomes parallel in the pull up network. For example, here the A and B are in series, therefore in the pull up network, they are in parallel, okay? And vice versa. Uh, parallel in the pull down network will become series in the pull up network. Okay, so quickly uh, do y equal to a plus b bar. So I'll do the pull down network first. So y bar is equal to a plus b, which means the two NMOSs have to come in parallel. And because they are in parallel in the pull down network, I keep them as series in the pull up network. Next question, implement y is equal to a, b, a and b. Can you implement this in a single stage? Why not? Ah, 
So the problem is if I were to write its truth table, we'll have zero zero. Right. So you have zeros here and one here, right? So zeros have to come from the pull down network and this has to come from the pull up network. This is not possible if you are using NMOS for the pull down network and PMOS for the pull up network, right? And we don't want to use PMOS in the pull down network because we know it doesn't pass the logic zero currently. So how many stages do you need to implement this? At least two stages. So you will first implement an AND. And then you take the output and pass it through another input. So this gives you a dot b bar. And then this gives you the complement of the which is a. So now let me give you a little bit more interesting problem. So please implement y is equal to a dot b plus c dot d the whole bar. So this is again uh, inverting in nature, which means you should be able to implement it in single stage. So in the pull down network, we have two branches, A, B in series, parallel with C, D in series. So now A and B have to come in parallel in the pull up network. A and B are in parallel. And this has to come in series. So I can directly make a connection from here with C and B. This is this okay? So you have written CD down and AP up. So logically, it doesn't make any difference. It will make slight differences when you are calculating the propagation delay, which we will deal with in a couple of classes. This is clear. Okay. So now a quick question for you to think. I think this is the second question. So what happens if I if we switch, if B and C are interchanged in the PUN. You can check if this is still the correct circuit or it is implementing some other logic. This is a homework. Now, this particular circuit is what we call as a AOI-22. Have you seen such terms before? No issues. So this stands for and or invert and then two numbers, two, two, right? So as you imagined, your first stage is some and gate, second stage is an or gate, and the last stage is an inverter, and or inverter. So the number of digits here, so you have first digit, second digit, you have two digits. The number of digits here is telling you the number of in, number of inputs to the second stage. So you have two digits, which means your OR has two inputs, okay? Now the value of these digits is telling you the number of inputs in the first stage of AND. So OR has two inputs, which means you will have a connection like this. 
right? Now the first AND gate has two inputs. So that is one, two, A, B. The second AND gate also has two inputs. So this gives you C, D. And this is your output. So this is A dot B. This is C dot D. Here you get A dot B plus C dot D. And the output is finally A dot B plus C dot D, the whole. Okay. So one last question for you to try out right now. Implement OAI31 using single stage at transistor level. Right, let's do OAI31 together. So this is OR and invert. So you know that the first stage is an OR gate. Second stage is an AND gate. And the last stage is an inverter. How many digits do you have? Two. So this means that the second stage has two inputs. So you need to connect one OR gate and the other also goes to another OR gate. So now let us look at the number of inputs of the OR gate. The value of the first digit is three, which means the first OR gate has three inputs. So I'll call this as A, B, C. Now the value for the second OR gate is one. So you're looking at an OR gate with one input, right? So which means you don't need an OR gate at all. You can directly connect it like this. Okay, so this is A plus B plus C. This is of course D. Now the expression here is A plus B plus C into D. And finally the output is A plus B plus C into D, the whole part, right? So now do a single stage transistor level implementation for this. The dual of this is you will have one branch with input as D coming in parallel with series combination of A, B, and C. This is your. So one more homework. So you can repeat the same exercise for O A I triple two. Implement this in single stage at transistor. We can wrap up the class. Thank you.